Hi everybody, Russ Barkley here with another weekly research update on research published this week on ADHD. This is for the week ending September 1st. And the moose just stopped in to say hi everybody. Say hi moose. Yep, that's our buddy. He'll be back in another cameo later. Let's put him down. There you go, moose. There you go. All right, have a good time. Okay, this week, we don't have an awful lot of exciting news to report, but there are some interesting papers that were published that I'd like to comment on. And all the rest of the research that did show up this week is in the thumbnail sketch that goes with this video, as always. So uh, let's get started. There was a nice paper that was published in the Annals of Epidemiology on the role of preterm or early birth in increasing the risk of ADHD in children. Uh, born to those uh, those mothers with early or preterm birth. This was a national study that was conducted over in Sweden, and it involved a huge number of individuals, over 4 million uh, individuals that had been born in Sweden between 1973 and 2013. And using the Swedish uh, medical records registry, they were able to track these children over time and see whether or not they went on to develop ADHD and if so, what the prevalence was. Uh, and what they found, as you can see down here, is that the prevalence of ADHD at individuals who were uh, of gestational age at birth and classified uh, as extremely preterm were, or excuse me, was about 12%. Uh, that's nearly double the rate that we see in the general population for children. They found in those that were moderately preterm, which is about 28 to 33 weeks, about 7% of the children went on to get a diagnosis of ADHD. That fell to uh, nearly 6% for those that were late preterm, born between 34 and 36 weeks, and about 6% for all preterm individuals. So. Uh, overall, uh, it looks like that we've got a propensity here for children born extremely premature or moderately premature, that is before 33 weeks, to go on to have an increased risk of ADHD that's about two to two and a half times higher than that seen in the general population. So this study corroborates a number of earlier papers going back more than 30 years in research on ADHD that routinely showed that premature births increase the risk of ADHD. And by the way, in some studies, that risk was as high as 40 to 45 percent if the children were required to go into a neonatal intensive care unit. Those, of course, would be the most uh, medically ill of the children that were born prematurely. But in general, there does appear to be some risk of preterm birth. Now, why is that? A few studies that were done uh, over a decade ago did brain scans of these children and then looked at the findings on the brain scans of these neonates with the development of ADHD later. And what it found is that of those who were born prematurely, it was the group that had very small minor bleeds into the primarily frontal lobe area, but also elsewhere, such as the basal ganglia, that these were the children that went on to have higher risks of ADHD than those who didn't have such bleeding as a result of premature delivery. So it looks like it's the preemies who experience a certain amount of brain uh, bleeding that are the highest risk for ADHD. And that makes perfect sense when they're bleeding into the brain, even minor bleeding, it does damage the surrounding tissue. Uh, and if that tissue happens to be part of the prefrontal and frontal lobe executive circuitry, then we can expect that to go on to produce an ADHD-like pattern of behavior. So in general, this study agrees with many previous studies on the role of prematurity in increasing risk for ADHD. So have a look at that if you like. Our next study comes from Malaysia. This is a study that was published in the journal Children, and it's estimating the risk of ADHD in the parents of children who had been diagnosed with the disorder. And then it looks at a variety of 
of factors that might influence that risk. Uh, so basically, if there's an ADHD child in the family, what is the likelihood that the parent has the disorder? And you can see here in the results that uh, they only had 45 children with ADHD in this particular study, but they found that a third of them, 15 of the 45, had parents who met diagnostic criteria for the disorder. Interestingly, the severity of the child's ADHD was worse in those children whose parents also had ADHD, which makes some sense because it suggests that there's an even higher genetic loading in those families where there is ADHD in a parent, it predisposes to ADHD in a child, and the child's ADHD is likely to be worse than in children who don't have a parent with ADHD. Uh, it, of course, did find that where parents had ADHD, the children had more academic problems, more behavioral problems at home and at school uh, than did the children who didn't have parents with ADHD. Again, all of which indicates that those children had somewhat worse disorder. Now, these findings uh, are actually in agreement with a number of studies done in the US and Canada looking at risk of ADHD within family members, in this case with parents, if a child had ADHD. Uh, and the statistics are very similar to what other studies have found. Uh, and that is that if you have a child with ADHD, what is the risk to a sibling? It's about 35%. What's the risk if the sibling is a twin? it goes up to between 75 and 90 percent. Uh, why isn't it a perfect agreement if ADHD is a genetic disorder? Because in some cases, the child's ADHD isn't due to genetics. It's due to other factors. We talked about one, preterm or premature birth. So it's possible that you can have one twin with ADHD and the other one doesn't have it if the first twin acquired that ADHD through some biological hazard, such as pregnancy and birth complications, lead poisoning, something like that. Those would be cases where there's discordance between the two twins. Though in general, if one twin has the disorder, the other is highly likely to have it in cases where the ADHD is genetic. Uh, now, what if a child has ADHD? What's the risk to the parent? As this study indicates, it's between 20 and 35%, about 20% for moms, upwards of 30 to 35% for fathers. Now let's reverse that. If the parent is identified as having ADHD, what's the risk to the offspring? And it's 40 to 50% meaning that upwards of about half of the offspring born to parents that have ADHD, one or the other, that that child is highly likely to have ADHD, which means that ADHD is a strongly inherited disorder. As I've said in earlier presentations, it's not due to a single gene. We know that ADHD is the result of multiple genes, each gene contributing a small risk, and you have to have multiple small risk genes to get you into the clinical range of ADHD symptoms. So uh, again, a nice pattern here in this study that agrees with other studies showing a familial aggregation of ADHD within families, which is what you would expect if ADHD was a strongly genetic disorder. So uh, again, another interesting study there uh, for you to think about. The third study is in the Journal of, this is pediatrics, in, <clears throat> uh, let's see, I, oh, I can't identify the country at this point, sorry about that, uh, but in any case, it had to do with the consequences of COVID-19, the pandemic, on individuals with ADHD, and this was a systematic review. It found over 220 articles and selected 27 for its review that met their criteria for review. And the reviewed studies had over 7,000 patients. Uh, in general, what the study found and what this review finds, excuse me, uh, is that the pandemic led to a problems with accessing treatment for ADHD, makes perfect sense. Uh, 
it led to an increase in disruptive behavior in the individuals uh, and also disrupted sleep. There was also considerable difficulties in people with ADHD uh, re using remote learning and benefiting from it. And these studies found that there was an increase in the use of social media during the pandemic, uh, especially among those with ADHD. No surprise there, of course, when people are locked down to their homes, they're going to turn to electronic means of socializing with others. Uh, the study also noted something I mentioned much earlier in another research review uh, that dealt with the pandemic, and that is that there was some improvement in certain aspects of family functioning during the pandemic. Uh, and that was that family members had more leisure time together. And in many instances, that leisure time was viewed as pleasurable or beneficial to the children and their parents. So it wasn't all bad, even though most of the effects of the pandemic were adverse effects on people with ADHD. So uh, feel free to have a look at that particular study uh, again, if you like. Lastly, we're going to take a look at a study that was trying to find the best way to screen preschool children for ADHD in order to identify those who would go on to have persistent ADHD. Uh, understand that when you screen preschoolers with just a rating scale that has ADHD symptoms, uh, although you detect true cases of disorder, you also get a high rate of false positives because you're just using a rating scale completed by parents. There's no more thorough evaluation to go over uh, the parents and uh, the parents' reports with an interview to corroborate that through other sources of information and so on the way we would in a clinical assessment of ADHD. But still, screenings can be useful. Uh, what this study found <clears throat> is that if you screen children at three and a half, five, and eight, and you look at the rate of ADHD at each stage and at all three stages, what they found is that about 30% of the children were classified as ADHD at at least one of those three screenings. However, only 4% had persistent ADHD as determined by having ADHD at at least two or three of those assessments. So the study concludes that if you're going to screen for ADHD, you should do the screening twice, about, oh, a year and a half apart, as they did here, age three and a half and five. And if the child meets the criteria for ADHD at each screening, the odds are it's going to be a very persistent disorder, and they're going to go on to have a clinical form of the disorder. We found this in, in my study. I conducted a five-year early intervention study in the city of Worcester, Massachusetts. I was screening over a thousand children coming into kindergarten each year for ADHD and other behavior problems. We used a very simple questionnaire that parents completed within a couple of minutes at kindergarten registration. Uh, but there, when we found that the children passed our screen with a high score, we then referred them over to our clinic for a more thorough evaluation before they could enter the study. Turns out that about 70% of the children that screened positive for ADHD went on to actually have that disorder. So screening can be beneficial at identifying high-risk cases, and many of those cases will be ADHD on clinical evaluation. But notice, not all of them. There is some false positives here when you just use a rating scale once. So uh, again, another interesting study, this one over in the European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Journal. So, okay, four studies that we've talked about this week. Again, you can look at the others over in the thumbnail sketch. Uh, and if you enjoy these research findings that I try to publish each week with you, uh, please uh, recommend this channel to others. Uh, and don't forget the, to, to hit the subscribe button uh, if you are not a subscriber to this channel. So, okay, everybody, the Moose and I will see you uh, in another week for another roundup of weekly research on ADHD. Be well, everybody.